Have you thought about the challenge that those who stand before you in chapel face each week and choosing something to say that you want to be edifying and, and uh, meaningful? You know, there are all kinds of preachers. There are mad preachers, sad preachers, and glad preachers. I mean in the way they preach. There's some people can't preach until they get mad. Have you ever noticed that? I'd be mad about something in order to preach, really preach. And then some are so somber and sad. And then once in a while you find one who is just glad. Everything's good and, and uh, God's in control. And, and uh, so we wonder, what do we, should we be as a, a speaker? And you know, sometimes it has to do with what you're talking about. And, and uh, some attitudes are inappropriate for some topics. But... Uh, we always have a challenge <clears throat> to have something to say. I used to teach my students in the homiletics classes that, that you cannot deliver well nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's important to have content, say something worthwhile. So the first idea is to put together something that's needed, appropriate to an audience, and then Put it in an organized fashion so that it can be remembered and, and then deliver it to the best of your ability. <clears throat> but there's a challenge every time we speak. But I'm not crying. I enjoy the opportunity. Today, however, I'm not going to approach it from a mad, sad, or glad approach. I just want to talk to you today about what is revealed to us in the seventh chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. God wants us to know him. Now that's extremely difficult for finite human beings to know or to understand an infinite God. But he's revealed himself to us in his word and uh, he's told us He's demonstrated. He's given it to us in story form. He's done all that he can do to help us to understand. And the more we understand or know God, the more we're going to surrender to him. John tells us in 1 John 2, 3 through 5, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith that I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, verily in him is the love of God perfected. There's something about the connection between total surrender to a loving God who is all powerful and means what he says. There's something satisfactory in that kind of relationship. And that's what God would have with his people. Turn your Bibles, if you haven't, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7. And I think from this chapter, we understand one of the basic natures of God. Now, I'm admitting we don't fully know God except as we know his word. But one of the things we learn about God from his word is that he hates evil. God not only hates it, but he's bent on its destruction. And he will destroy it. In this seventh chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, the word destruction, destroy or destruction, appears eight times at least in the NIV version. God is a God who will destroy. And that really should be a kind of a frightening word to us. But let me tell you about this book. A great sea of people is before Moses, at the end of Moses' life, and he delivers three sermons to remind the children of Israel about their relationship that they have had with God and that they will have with God 
And the choice of the kind of relationship depends on them. Because God is consistent. God does not change his attitude toward evil, nor does he change his capacity for love. And both of these things are paramount in this scripture. If, if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, you know that Moses begins by just rehearsing the history of the children of Israel during his leadership. He tells about the time when he actually lived with them in Egypt and they were slaves. Uh, he gives the history of their exodus from uh, the Egyptian bondage. He talks about the mistakes of their fathers and he talks about the wilderness wanderings. But he emphasizes the covenant God has with them because it is a covenant that he began with Abraham, repeated it to Isaac and to Jacob, that Israel is his special nation, his special people. So in the midst of this second speech, chapter 7, he repeats the Ten Commandments. He talks about loving God and keeping his commandments and teaching those commandments to your children, chapter 6. Now Moses is ready to discuss the specifics of the request uh, that he has of his people as they're in beginning the conquest of Canaan. Moses is about to die. Joshua will become their leader, and they're to move into the land of Canaan. There are several nations here in this land that they're to utterly eradicate. There are the Hittites, Gergesites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. If you'll note, in the earlier chapters, prior to chapter 7, uh, there are principles involved in this relationship. He said, Moses says, 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the Zerid Valley. By then, that entire generation of fighting men had, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. The Lord's hand was against them until he had completely eliminated them from the camp. He's talking about those men that were 20 years of age and older, those that rebelled to go in when the 10 spies came back. God completely eradicated them. In chapter 4, he says, now Israel, hear the decrees and laws that I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you to do. Do not uh, subtract from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, that I give you. So don't add to it or take away from anything that I'm telling you. Follow it exactly. And then he says, what other nation, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws that I'm setting before you today? In other words, where is a better deal than we have here? So he's charging them to be faithful to the God who has made covenant with them. And so in verse 32 of chapter 5, he says, So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper along and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. And now chapter 7 is where he talks about the destruction of evil. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering in to possess and drives out before you 
many nations, the Hittites, Gergesites, Amorites, um, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. This is the first uh, thought of the destruction of evil here. God says uh, he'll destroy, and he has destroyed, but he's saying to Israel, when you go into this land and I give you the power to overcome these nations that are mightier than you, then you've got the responsibility to destroy them. And the reason for the need to destroy them is that they're evil. And that if your daughters marry their men and your men marry their daughters, they corrupt you. And you'll be evil as they are. So instead of destroying them, you would embrace them. Now, as we're reading about this and thinking about evil in the world, what were the sins these folks were guilty of? Well, the Canaanites are descriptive of all of these people. We call them all Canaanites. They were detestable in their practices. They worshipped idols, graven images. Their guilt was idolatry. They had sexual problems, mistakes. Sex with temple prostitutes as part of their worship child sacrifices and other forms of human sacrifices to their gods. They were guilty of spiritism, witchcraft, homosexuality, and extreme cruelty to the nations round about them. And all of the sins that accompany all those things. God looked at those nations and his wrath was full. I think the book of Revelation would describe it as the bowls of God's wrath are full. He will get up. Reminds us of the sixth chapter of Genesis when God saw Noah as a man who was good, but not perfect, but could be a recipient of his grace. And he found grace now as the Lord. But every thought and every imagination of man's heart was upon evil continually. God destroyed. He wiped out the people. God is a God of love. But one thing we must understand about God is that he hates evil. He will not abide it. He is holy. He is different. And so utter destruction was what he would command. Look at verse 3 of chapter 7 of, of Deuteronomy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons to ta or take their daughters for your sons. For it will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the, uh, the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Every time you read this word destroy in this chapter, underline it. God's talking about destroying evil, but if we imbibe evil, he'll destroy us. Here's what verse 5 says. This is what you're to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols with fire. There are four important verbs here. Break down, smash, cut down, burn. All of those are destructive terms. And that's what the children of Israel do with uh, the activities of the people whose lands they're about to take. You see, the land of Canaan was to be a sanctuary for God as he dwelt among his people. God wants us to detest sin as much as he does. And whatever God hates, 
we should hate. What God loves, we should love. In verses 25 and 26 of Joshua chapter 7, we read about God's dealing with Achan, who sinned when the children of Israel had gone to take the city of Jericho. God had said, everything in this city is to be destroyed. Everything. Everything, he says, is under the ban. And so the possessions of the Canaanites were in the sight of God contaminated. They're under the ban. But we know Achan saw some gold and some silver and some garments that he thought he could take and hide in his tent floor. But when they went to take the little city of Ai, smaller city, they had been very successful in Jericho, but he sent up some spies to Ai and they came back and said, don't send the whole army of Israel up there, just a few people up there, send two or 3,000. He sent 3,000, but they came back with their tails tucked and 36 of them were killed. They were running from them. Well, you know what Joshua did. And he fell on his face before the Lord and he said, oh, alas, oh God, alas. What's going to, what, what is it that one of your people turn and run? And said, why this defeat? What are we going to do? And, and uh, Joshua just gets real concerned about God's character. He said, and what about your name, oh God? People are not even going to believe you anymore. They're not going to fear you. God said, get up off your face. Prayer is not what you need right now. Joshua, you got sin in the camp. And chapter 7 begins with Israel has sinned. God won't bless sin. And God had them to uh, decipher who was guilty. Achan was the one who had taken it, but as long as that sin was tolerated in the camp, God called it Israel's sin. Sin had to be removed. It was God's will that Achan be stoned and the stone fell on top of him and burned. Remove completely the evil. Sometimes people say, my God is a God of love. He wouldn't do those things. My God is a God of love, and he does do those things. Because the opposite of love is hate. He loves righteousness, holiness, but he hates sin. And our attitude ought to be something like his, of course. The land of Canaan was to be to God, or his people were to be, a sanctuary for him. We've all heard the song about, I want to be a sanctuary. We want our hearts to be a place where God lives. We sing the song, pure in heart of God, help me to be. We can't be pure and contaminated at the same time. Evil has to be removed for purity to exist. Some have had experience with cancer. And we know that cancerous cells have to be removed for healthy cells to live. For us to live and prosper, we need to remove the sin. Chapter 7 reminds us of the importance of the covenant. If you look at verses 7 to 9, the Lord did not set his affection on you, he's talking to Israel, and choose you because you were more numerous and more than other people, for you were fewer than all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors, that he brought you out of the with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. 
He is faithful, God, keeping his covenant of love to the thousand generations of those who love him and who keep his commandments. So the covenant of our God is a God of purity, but it's also a God of, it's a covenant of love. Now, we read these Old Testament stories to learn the principles, the divine, eternal truths that are applicable to us today. He says, those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay their face, uh, to, to repay to their face those who hate him. God is powerfully opposed to evil. He will destroy it. Therefore, take care to follow the commandments, decrees, and laws that I give you today. Love is attached to the covenant. So when people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a, is a cruel God. He is not cruel. He is a destructive God to evil, but he's a loving God. He loves those who do his bidding. He said, if you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your ancestors. He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, the, the calves of your herd and the lambs of your flocks in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. He will be, uh, you will be blessed more than any other people. None of your men or women will be childish, nor will any of your livestock be without young. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but he will inflict them on all that hate you. You must, here it is again, destroy all the peoples the Lord your God gives over to you. Do not look on them with pity. Do not serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. I think all of us, even today, have difficulty not looking with pity upon those who are destructive of themselves because they refuse the will of God. As he continues in this discussion, Moses reminds the people that our God is a great and an awesome God. He says, no one will be able to stand up against you. You will destroy these wicked people. And then in the last verse of the uh, seventh chapter, he says, do not bring a detest detestable thing into your house or you like it will be set apart for destruction, regarded as vile and utterly detested for it is set apart for destruction. There are some things that are hard to teach because they're hard to learn and hard to convince ourselves of. And I think one of these things is the vast difference between good and evil. Now, you'd think that'd be something easy to understand, but there is a difference. Does all this have an application to us today? The main themes in this chapter are remember the covenant. A covenant is an agreement. God had an agreement with Israel. Number two, prepare yourself for warfare against evil. And number three, understand the rewards, the compensations, and the consequences of your choice. And every one of these things, each of these three things is applicable to us today as Christians. We have all entered into a covenant with God through Christ. Jesus died for us. He promised us redemption through his blood. He says, come to me. We have come, we've confessed our 
faith in his lordship. We've committed ourselves to him. We accept him as Lord. The covenant is complete. We each have a part to play. The promise on either side. And when we keep covenant with the Lord, we're blessed. So we've all entered into the covenant. The second thing that makes us like Israel is that we have a battle to fight. It's a war with spiritual forces of wickedness. And Ephesians 6 tells us about that warfare. If you've noticed, that whole description of the warfare talks about the armor that we're to put on, but we have only one instrument with which to fight and that's the sword of the spirit so we protect ourselves but we go out and fight with a sword it's a spiritual warfare but we must fight it and the third thing is that we understand that loving god and he keeping his commandments does carry reward with it in this life and especially in the life to come. So my question for myself, and I hope that you would have the same question, are we ready to tear down, to smash, and to hew down, and to burn the graven images, the evil in our world, and fight with valor, with the sword of the Spirit, and then trust God for the victory over evil.